Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. Here's your host, Tom Bourne. Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. I'm your host, Tom Bourne, and with me today is the amazing Jonathan Wilson. Jonathan, how are you? I'm very good. Thanks, Tom. Really nice to be talking to you. What's the weather like in England these days? Um, well, the last three weeks, we've had a, an absolute scorcher. My lawn outside is um, almost brown because we've had such hot weather. Um, it's a bit over overclouded today, but hopefully that's just a, a blip in the <laughs> problem. We had so much rain during the winter. I'm hoping we have a really hot summer now, like last summer. Okay. Uh, when you talk about scorcher, what types of temperatures are you talking about in Celsius? Well, I think we've 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 hit up to twenty five, twenty six. So, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. It's, I, I know. Well, Having wait. said that, you know, I I lived in I lived in Sydney many years ago, and um, people I'd had loads of Australians telling me about how cold Britain was, and I I was working um, for the Attorney General in New South Wales. I lived in Manly, and I used to get the ferry over, and during the winter in in there. The amount of times I got off that ferry at Circular Quay and my teeth were chattering. <laughs> so well, it's uh, it's officially winter here in Perth, and I think we got up to a maximum of seventeen to great seventeen degrees today, which is a little bit below what you've got in summer. So, um, oh well. Mm. Uh, do you do you follow the do you follow the cricket at all, my friend? Uh, not really. No, I but, was always a, a more of a rugby person. That's a shame. We, we, we're about to give you guys, I think, a 5 nil hiding uh, in the tour over there. But that's all right. We won't talk about that. Do you know, years ago, I had, I had a friend um, from Melbourne and her dad used to give me lots of ribbing about um, about the cricket. And then I was back here and it's, it must have been in the, in the early 90s and uh, England beat Australia in loads of matches. And... Um, I was so pleased because of the ribbing he'd given me. I sent him a with sympathy <laughs> card. Uh, and it arrived, the day, it arrived the day after their horse had died. <laughs> <laughs> Is that perfect timing or what? You <laughs> yeah. a, it's a card that covers all occasions. Well done, mate. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, you've had a, a pretty interesting professional life. Uh, how did you end up working as a safety professional? Um uh, dealing with psychosocial risks and can you tell us a little bit about your background leading into this okay yeah right well i i i would say that i don't actually work in 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 this for money i do this um because i'm a campaigner and an ambassador so i work with an organization called stop her at work hashtag stop her at work um but I'm I'm a campaigner uh, against workplace bullying and and safer psychological uh, and for safer psychological workplaces. Um, the reason for it is because I um, spent 28 years in the police. Usually you'd spend 30. I spent 28 years in the police, and I rose to quite a senior rank in in the Metropolitan Police as a detective superintendent in um, for the last 10 years of my service. Um, round about. 2013, 2014, I was posted into a command where um, I knew there was a lot of nepotism. I'd worked there before. Um, and at that point, I mean, I, I, I had about, I think, probably 22, 23 years of police experience. I'd worked all over the world. I, I'd worked in pretty dangerous situations. Um, I was a bit long in the tooth. And I had no, I, I believed in the organisation's policies, values, and ethics, and I found myself encountering um, very, I can say, pernicious behaviour from a couple of managers. And I put it down at first to being a couple of difficult people, and I, I was motivated to get on with the job and lead the team. I had a, a team of a couple of hundred people, and um, in improving the work. And this behaviour continued and eventually um, started to experience gaslighting as well. If you've, um, I, I, I know you want to talk about that later, but um, that's, that then started to impact on my confidence. Um, and eventually some pretty, um, well, some 
flawed attempts to push me out of my role were attempted by both of those managers, which I challenged three of them um, and, and they had to back down. But each time they did, they came back with another flawed attempt. And eventually it dawned on me that, you know, what had been going on wasn't just difficult people. You know, I had been getting been the target of bullying behaviour. And that was because I'd been challenging the status quo and I'd been challenging them for not doing some of the things that they should be doing. Um, I At this point, I decided to go and speak to a, one of the senior leader who happened to be one of the most senior police officers in the country. So I sent her an email and said, I, you know, I feel like I've been bullied. I'd like to come and speak to you. And she put me in the diary to see her a week later. And when I went to see her, and I, I'll say at this point, when I went into the office, to, into her office to see her, I was a broken man with everything that had happened with me, with the gaslighting and, and you know, some of the really more overt attempts with bullying. Um, and every, as I started to recount what was happening, her response to me to all, everything I said was, that's your view. That's your view. And I had a cold clinical stare of that's your view. It was almost a look of contempt and the sound of contempt. And, um, and as I dried up, realising there was no point in going on, she then turned around and said, from everything I've heard, you're the problem. During that meeting, it became quite obvious that she'd spent the, the week intervening um, between me asking for the meeting and actually seeing her to go and speak to the bullies. So she'd already made her mind up. Um, and as I've said many times since, you know, I, I went into that meeting a broken man and left absolutely destroyed. Over the next 12, 18 months, my confidence just continue, continued to spiral down Um and I became ill. I was um, I was suffering. I'd already been seeing the doctor around stress and insomnia. Um, I started to suffer rumination, um, the stress, the um, depression, anxiety, um, to the point that I eventually ended up taking long periods of um, time off work sick. Um, I went through several forms of CBT training. Um, I spent time with the local mental health trust, being treated for, for the depression and the anxiety. And eventually I was diagnosed with trauma and I had trauma counselling. As, as I started to recover, as part of my recovery, alongside exercise and the treatment that I was getting from um, medical staff, I started to study about workplace bullying. And as I started to learn more and more about workplace bullying, I started to realise that had I known all of these things when it happened, I'd have picked up on what was happening earlier and possibly even been able to deal with it better than I had done. Um, so, you know, as, I, as a consequence of all of this sickness, I eventually decided for my own health that I was going to leave the police two years early. I was fortunate because I could still take a, although somewhat reduced pension, take a pension and leave. And I decided that I was going to use that knowledge to, to raise awareness and help others. And that's how I became a, a campaigner and an advocate against workplace bullying. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I've worked in enforcement roles and compliance roles, uh, dealing with public, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of my working career in a different mode, different um, fields, never with the police. I, to be honest, I was never good enough. Um, but... I found that those fields were uh, very much, I won't say alpha male, but uh, very much uh, you had to basically prove how tough you were, how, you know, that you could never demonstrate any vulnerability or weakness to anyone because you would get characterised as, you know, weak, soft, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is, is that the same where you worked? Yes, I, I I really think it is. I mean, I mean that was probably part of my reluctance to um, to to recognise what was happening with me at first, and just to put it off as you know as some some difficult people you know that I was dealing with, and you know, um, I at that point in life I also thought you know I've you know I've I've seen the worst that life can throw at anyone you know with the work that I'd done and the things that I'd seen in my work, um, and therefore. You know, you know, I I can overcome this. You know, I can deal with this, and that that's actually a real flaw. You know, because you know, to to believe that you have the resilience when actually, you know, internally your mind isn't coping. Mm. 
you know, can leave you to be really, really vulnerable. I would say to you is, it, it, you know, the other thing around things like policing is that, you know, you're you're de- you're working with a within a command and control mm-hmm. environment and a very hierarchical environment as well. You know, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> I've never been a fan of command and control. I've never been in, in modern workplaces. And, and, you know, we get the justification that in certain type of high impact situations, that you've just got to not be able to think. You've just got to follow commands and stuff like that. Well, that's okay in emergency situations, but not in day-to-day operations of the business. And it, whether it's public service or not, it's still a business. You can't treat your people like they don't have a say or they don't have input. Um, it, it really is not, to me, 1950s, 1960s sort of military thinking that we just mm. haven't progressed. Um, and it, it, I, I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I've had people come in and post on my comment where you, you know, you're in a command and control. You know, it's got to be like that. And I was like, well, no, it has when there's a critical incident. You know, if there's a murder scene, yep. you know, or, or there's an armed incident, or you mm. know, a threat to life. Yeah, then there has to be structured command and control. So the person in charge has to say, I want this done, this done, this done. I want it done now. Yep. But in day to day management, you know, and leadership, you should be listening to staff, or you know. Um, I, a, a good colleague of mine, a colleague of mine who works in the same area, but has written a book, and um, it's it's called "Speak Up, Listen Down." You know, and people who, you know, people who are working on, should we say, the shop floor, who see what's really happening, should be allowed to speak up and uh, make people aware of dangers. And those at the top should be listening to those people below because they won't have the full picture otherwise. Yeah, it's it's one of those great disappointments professionally for me that I, I i see that it's not changing the, the, the thinking does not seem to change in in certain well let's be honest the enforcement type fields it doesn't change we seem to be promoting people who have the same group think as as the people 20 years before them and it's just like you know times have moved on we've actually in the rest of society realized that you know the people literally like you say on the shop floor have got valuable input and should be listened to because if nothing else it's best practice but it's also the law you know it's actually the law that we have this consultation going on meaningful consultation rather than this is the way um yeah it is disappointing Mm. all right yeah Uh, Go on. I was just going to say my view as as someone who was in a leadership role was that, you know, um, we've all got blind spots and I hadn't got a, ever got a 360 degree view of, of what was happening. And to be able to appraise the pu- true picture, I needed to listen to people because people might see things that I hadn't seen. And <laughs> if they're going to stop me walking into a big hole, I'm going to be very, very grateful for them warning me. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, it's a question I ask anyone who enters in any of these sort of enforcement roles or any sort of compliance activities um, when they sign up. Um, and I expect I'll get the same answer that I usually get, but uh, why did you, why did you join the police initially? Um, I, for several reasons. Um, one is I wanted to help people. Um, also, I knew that I, I was good um, with communication and been able to talk people you know down who are being aggressive um and and also to stand firm you know to stand firm in in, in you know in the face of confrontation so um i sort of recognized um through sort of part-time jobs that i'd had working you know within the hospitality industry that um I, i'd got the the ability i was quite good at it and and it offered a lot of um opportunity to go and you know see you know um, have a, have a, an interesting career ahead of me as well as helping people yeah i've never met anyone who's who's joined any of these enforcement roles who hasn't said they wanted to help people or they wanted to 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 make a difference to the world everyone enters the field with the absolute best intentions and also these really optimistic views. Uh, I saw a post from a former policeman the other day that said, I entered the force to change the world 
I left the force after the world had changed me. Uh, would that be a fair characteristic of what it's like for most people in the field? I think pros, quite possibly, yes. Um, I mean, in, in many respects, I think it, 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 it changed me changed me for for the better in many respects i mean you know some people can end up leaving and being very very cynical um i'm very critical of leadership in 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 the police certainly the the the, the police force that i work for which was the metropolitan police service um i think there's some terrible leadership there at the moment but and and as you i alluded to earlier promotion systems about how they identify leaders as well but um you know, the experiences that it brought me, um, the things that I saw, the people and the characters I met, both within the organisation and the people I interacted with over the years, either working with in partnership or, um, you know, helping in the streets or possibly even arresting, you know, actually, it, it, it's all, it's it's a bit about the, like the law of um, forensics. Every person you meet or every um, experience you have leaves a mark on you and it, it, it builds your your character and uh, your future. And I, th I think I came out of it quite well. Um, even, you know, this terrible thing that happened to me around the workplace bullying that, you know, I, you know, suffered mental injury, psychological injury from, you know, I've, I've come back stronger from it and I'm able to help other people with that experience now. So, you know, I, I look back very, very fondly on most of it. All right. I, I, I know from myself, now, I, it, it's taken me years to be able to admit it because, again, it's um, it's not something that uh, I find males like to admit, um, particularly males. Um, I got bullied uh, fairly significantly at one stage when I was working in an enforcement position. And uh, I know it's going to sound weak and, and, you know, so I'm sure someone will start call me a snowflake or something similar. But... Um, I found talking about it, even the thought of about thought of talking about it for a couple of years afterwards, I would well up with tears and and you know I I would struggle to uh, be able to talk about the situation. Um, similar situation for you? Yeah, very very similar. If you think this happened to me between twenty twelve and twenty fourteen, about um, two months ago. I went to be interviewed at Broadcasting House, the BBC, to, to undertake an interview at the BBC at Broadcasting House. Now, over my career, I, I've been interviewed several times in Broadcasting House. I was familiar with it and the layout and I got in, I arrived there and I was walking through and I was talking to the producer of this television programme and chatting away and quite comfortable. And I got into the room where the filming was about to start and I'm not camera shy. Um, you know, I, I've sat, sat, sat on live news television programs before to being interviewed. Um, and I walked in and literally at that moment, I felt my throat close up and tears started to pour from my eyes. And I hadn't been asked a question, hadn't even taken my jacket off. Just the whole thing and the impact and the significance of it came back. Um, and, and, and I was a mess for about five or ten minutes. Um you know, I wasn't wailing. It was very, very quiet, but my throat had closed up and, you know, I couldn't stop tears um, moving from my from my eyes and stuff. So, yeah, very, very um, impactful. And they say, you know, that if you've suffered any form of trauma, it never actually leaves you. You you learn to manage it, but you can it will never actually leave you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can believe that. I've, um, yeah. Hmm. For me, uh, for me, after the period of, of being upset about it, uh, there was a period of also a couple of years where I actually got very angry that we actually had to go through that nonsense. And uh, and it was actually, for me, the anger was not necessarily at the people that actually did this, but it was for the senior management who didn't condemn it, but actually condoned the behaviour and then tried to make it as if it, the person who was being bullied was the problem. Uh, it might not be the case for you, but for me, I found I got very angry. Yeah, I mean, I, and, you know, as I said to you in, earlier in my introduction, I, I said it back when you asked about how I ended up working with this area of, um, of you know, this this topic, 
I said, you know, with that senior leader, there was there was what we call DAVO, the deny, attack, reverse, victim, offender. Is, you know, it was an institutional DAVO where, you know, and it's a form of gaslighting where they 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 turn around and they they deny any of it's happened and that it, you know you're the fault and that does make make you angry and upset. It's institutional portrayal. It's a it's a form of you know institutional complicity where you know the leadership is being complicit with with the bullies, and um, and in that way there's a betrayal as well because you know most of these organisations have policies and they say they won't tolerate bullying. Um, particularly the police has a code of ethics about you know treating people with respect and dignity. You know colleagues as well, um, and and honesty, and integrity. Um, and all of those things were corrupted in that meeting, and that's the institutional trail. And this is one of the key points that I, I make, you know. And as I said, I went into that meeting, you know, a broken man and left destroyed. I will now say that the, now tell people that the institutional betrayal was actually far more harmful to my psychological well being than the bullying itself, you know, mm -hmm. because everything I'd believed in for the last 23 years, you know, was founded on a lie. One yeah. of the most senior police officers in the country was prepared to be complicit in in that bullying, you know, through denial um, or ignoring, you know, or, or or possibly, you know, even you know, being prepared to be dishonest about it. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, the most the the worst thing about it is when I went to see her, all I wanted I wasn't looking to get anyone into trouble. Mm -hmm. All I wanted was for that bullying behaviour to stop, you know. Yeah. And if she'd walked away from that meeting and said, right, I'm going to go and speak to the other people, you know, shown that she'd been objective about it and come back and said, look, there's two sides to the story, but I'm reminding everyone of what our expectations are and resetting things, then we'd have been very uh, happy. Oh, excuse me, I can't control that. It's a phone in the background. but That's all good. It's but, all good. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, it's... Yeah, it did make me angry, but but you know nowadays, I mean, I tend to be a bit more philosophical about it. I tend to look at the you know what those bullies were doing. Not not yeah, around the bullies, lots of it's learned behaviour. You know, because of that institutional complicity um, to the bullying, what what that senior leader did, and this has happened countless times before, I have no doubt, was saying that behaviour is okay. It's acceptable. So not only was she telling those individuals that that behaviour was OK, but all the people who witnessed that sort of behaviour were being told it was OK as well. So then you would see other people thinking, well, that's a use that that that's an accepted management practice, you know, to deal with someone that you may feel uncomfortable with, et cetera, et cetera, or a bit challenging, et cetera. That's a legitimate way to to deal with them. So I think with the bullies, Part of the bullying, the gaslighting, one of the bullies was the gaslighter as well. And there's there's more um, malice in that. But one of the bullies, I think, yeah, it was just normalised learned behaviours from yeah. not being challenged in, in the past. Yeah. I've recently seen a situation where um, top-down leadership has and their behaviours has basically trickled down to middle management where they've seen that if the top level manager can behave in a particular way, well, then that must be acceptable practice and we can treat the staff below us in the same manner. Um, is bullying and harassment just at its base form a failure of leadership? I, I think I really, really do think it is. It's because the, it's the leadership that should be setting the culture and that, that you know, you don't create culture by, um, you know, writing lots of nice, colourful posters and sticking up on the wall and saying job done. You know, leaders need to not only be setting those policies and that culture, but they need to be living and breathing it and leading by example and showing that those policies are alive and, you know, are to be adhered to. Through example, I think one of the one of the interesting things you'll see within the police, and I suspect this happens in, in other places as well. Certainly, you know, there's a big problem in bullying um, in health all over the world. Is um, in in the police, 
well, certainly in, within in the UK from the police, to be promoted from the rank of constable all the way up, you need the sponsorship of a line manager of your of your line manager. So to 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 be promoted, you need to have to acquiesce or emulate to the behaviours of your line manager. Yep. So if you don't acquiesce or emulate those behaviours, then there's very little chance of you getting that sponsorship. So what you ha- see is as you go up the, the pyramid, the hierarchical pyramid, you get more and more people behaving in the same way. And by the time they get to the top, they're all in, all because they've all followed or been promoted on those same similar behaviours. They're all reinforcing with each other that they're doing the right thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite frightening. And we, we've got many leaders um, who are... Um, are promoted because they were capable in a job that they did before, but not necessarily capable as um, um, as as managers and or leaders. And I, it's the Peter principle where someone is promoted beyond their own ability. And I use a very very simple description. This might be too simplistic for your video, but if you imagine a factory that and you've got a machine at one end, and it's producing yellow rubber ducks, and it's a conveyor belt. Along the side of that conveyor belt, you've got 10 workers, all with a little pot of orange paint. And they have to, as these ducks come out of the machine and go along the conveyor belt to be packed, the workers have to paint the beaks orange. And suddenly a job for that production line comes up for um, a supervisor of the production line. Yeah. Now, there's one person there that whenever for every five ducks that everyone else paints, this person's painting 10. So they say... He's really good at the job. Let's give him the job as a supervisor. But just because he can paint beaks on yellow ducks doesn't mean to say that he can manage or lead people effectively. And unfortunately, you see that happening in the workplace all the time. I, I, I used to call that uh, promotion to your level of incompetence. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, the best the best person in a particular role does not mean that they are the best person to supervise. And if you're not given... If you're not given extensive um, support and leadership training, I, I think you're destined to fail. You're, you're basically being set up to fail as a, as a leader anyhow. Um, yeah. I know a lot of good people that, that work their tail off. They really do to get into management positions. But when they get there, they just don't have a clue and they don't have the skill set at this stage to effectively yeah. manage anyone else. And what you're describing about the pyramid of, of leadership, to me, that's almost like a, a, an upward spiral of death, of groupthink that we're having where we're basically mm. getting clones of the previous generation and the previous generations of leadership. That's, um, yeah, that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting uh, way to <laughs> develop an organisation. Yeah. All right, you've mentioned gaslighting. You think about it in, Sorry. I was just going to say, think about it in health as well. You'll get surgeons... You know, who may be very, very good doctors, but they become surgeons and then they're suddenly they're managing all these people. But, you know, just because they're really good at surgery doesn't mean to say they're going to be, you know, at managing people. And you see lots of bullying in healthcare all yeah. over the world. Yeah. It's a real problem in healthcare. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you've mentioned gaslighting a few times. Um, and my lovely wife mentions gaslighting a lot. And uh, I, I will be honest and say um, there's been a few times when I've gone, uh, it's a trendy uh, new age term, but there's, mm-hmm. it's not, it's not. What What is gaslighting for people who've only heard about it, you know, in the periphery of thought? Okay. It's, it's when an individual tries to, um, tries to tell you that you're, your reality you know sorry the reality is very different from what your perceived reality is so in the case of my gaslighting there were things that were said I was pulled into meetings for ambush meetings Uh, and and, I'm sorry importantly to say and it leaves you doubting yourself and your 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 mental state then Um, I was called into ambush meetings with no agenda with with the gaslighter where he'd say you've upset two people and they're thinking about leaving the command. I was mm-hmm. like mortified because you know I'm very much a people person. So, you know, well, could you tell me who it is? No, they don't want to be identified. Well, could you give me some context then? Because I really can't think of how this has happened. You know, no, you just need to sort it out. 
And then I got this <laughs> happening again and again and again. And eventually, one of the reasons where I started to realize, and you know, I mean, it really was destroying my confidence. And I was walking around like I was walking around like I was treading on broken eggshells. And every time I had an interaction with someone, I was looking over my shoulder to check that I hadn't upset someone. Um, and then, you know, then some of the lies started to, you know, to come out that I I could categorically, I categorically knew weren't um, weren't true. You know, there was an incident where he told me that. Um, I'd upset um, the home office and the security service. Um, now, I was actually really, my contact within the home office, I was actually very good friends with socially, et cetera. And she said, you know, that's absolutely ridiculous. You know, we had a problem with you. We, you know, I tell you to your face, et cetera. Um, and we're getting better communication out of you than we've ever had out of anyone else in that command. And likewise, when I spoke to the security service, they said, no, our, our relationships only improve since you've come into your role, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it was, you know, and I knew I'd got a good working relationship with them. So this is when it started. I started to realize that a lot of these conversations, you know, that had been leaving me feeling very confused and insecure were made made up and, and purposely um, done to you know um, disorientate and um, and disrupt my confidence yeah yeah we that, that, some, is that a good explanation that's pretty good that's pretty good some of the other terms I've, I've heard in uh, workplaces uh, a bit more blue collar uh, things like white anting undermining um, yeah just doing those basic things but you're right I think gaslighting is basically getting the person to doubt their what they believe is actually happening has actually happened or yeah yeah getting them to doubt yeah in a, in a simple term it could be you opening a can of you know a cold can of beer and putting it down on the kitchen work surface or next to the barbecue and turning your back to stoke the barbecue and your wife snatching the beer away and throwing it in the bin and you turning around for your beer and say, do you know where my beer is? You haven't had a beer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you never had a beer. You haven't opened a beer. And or, you're there going, I'm sure you're there. Or of course it could be, uh, you've already had the beer. <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. oh, dear. Um, all right. Now, bullying and harassment. Uh, I've heard various figures thrown around. Is there any sort of definitive figures on the prevalence of it in, in, in modern day workplaces? Right. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there, there's lots of different figures. I, I think without, you know, quoting figures from, from, you know, the different organizations around the world, I would say on average, you know, the, the it's one in three workers has experienced workplace bullying, um, you know, throughout their career. Um, and, that about 25% of people who do experience bullying and harassment at work end up resigning yep. and leaving their workplace. So, I mean, it's really important for organisations to recognise this as well, because, you know, the recruitment and retention issues, you know, forget, don't, well, don't forget, but, the, you know, there are, there are financial costs of people being off sick, the financial mm. costs of if those, if those individuals decide to litigate against an organisation, and then and then there's the recruitment and retention, you know, because, you know, lots of organizations when they recruit people need to train them up and they invest a lot of money in training them up to do the role. They invest money in, in, in you know, in the advertising and recruitment as well. And then if those people do leave and they haven't been, you know, tied down by non-disclosure agreements, et cetera, they were going to go around telling their story to other people. And, and certainly with the internet, with things like glassdoor.com, you know, mm. they can give their, their, their ratings of what that employer was like or their experience with that employer. So, you know, they can really damage retention. Yeah. And the other thing is, you think, I mean, this, will, this is just as prevalent in any other career, especially public facing. So it could be in a shop or something like that. But if you, you think, say, a police officer who's interacting with the public every day, sometimes in stressful situations, they're bullying, they're stressed, and they're they're they're, they're you know they're anxious, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It may actually impact on how they deal with the public, how polite they are to the public, you know, whether they have a short fuse if things become aggressive, 
you know, etc. Whether their anxiety gets the best of them and they see something that's more threatening than it actually is, and you know, you know, it's actually pretty dangerous behaviour in 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 roles like the police, and very costly in roles like you know, if I was a car sales manager and I was being bullied, you know, and I I was suffering stress and you know um, depression and um, and anxiety. I possibly wouldn't be the best salesperson when you came in to spend thousands and thousands of dollars or, or pounds on buying a brand new motor car. Yeah, look, uh, it, it, it's an interesting thing. Police officers, law enforcement in particular, but all, any sort of frontline responders, it's well known that they suffer uh, a lot more post-traumatic stress disorders uh, than the general public. You'd think that uh, those in charge would actually, I don't know, treat you with kit gloves more than anything because I know, I know of people uh, in, for example, corrections where they've been subject to various behaviours and the combination of dealing with the day-to-day events and the... Uh, uh, insidious nature of, of some of the uh, things from their um, co-workers they've actually taken their lives they've actually taken their mm. lives and and it, it it is a great shame you see these wonderful people absolute wonderful people and they're gone um, yeah I, I i i really worry about how we treat frontline providers mm. because let's be honest without you society is the potential to fall apart it's not a job for everyone you 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 certainly have to have a certain skill set and you certainly have to be fairly resilient anything to undermine you guys is um and i mean guys collectively um not just as hmm. males is it is, is more than dangerous it's just plain stupid yeah All yeah right. and you think many parts of the world as well you know i'm not in the uk well we're very few in the uk but many parts you're sending these people out who may be suffering from mental health issues because of that behavior who, who are carrying a sidearm yes yes yeah, yeah. You know, so think of the danger as well yeah i and I, I know that's actually yeah another topic firearms we won't get into that particularly not for our I don't know, some of our uh, people in other continents that have a few issues with those things. Mm. All right. Uh, are some workplaces, in your opinion, more prevalent to have bullying and harassment than others? Um, I think I think a lot, you know, certainly in, in command and control, although um, and hierarchical structures, you know, old fashioned hierarchical structures, which aren't necessarily, you know, the typical sort of police or military command and control, but some of the, you know, the, the older institutions, um, what we need out there is transformational leadership. Um, I would say that workplace bullying, my experience of studying it is that workplace bullying um, impacts across all employment sectors. But I do see lots of it happening within areas like policing and and in health, um, particularly, you know, they're, they're particular, particularly strong areas. But one one caution I put onto the command and control, and there is still, you know, we do, do still get reports of bullying within the British military. But I do fully support what in the British Army, all officers that go go through Sanders now and are trained. Are, are taught um, one thing that's really, really important, and that is that their role is that they um, they lead to serve. Mm. And that is a, emphasizing to them that it, their leadership isn't all about them. Their leadership is about the welfare of all of those people who work beneath them and who are their leading. And also that, and I have a good friend who's a, um, a colonel in the military and you know and he's made the point nowadays you know because bullying has been such an issue if there is a complaint of bullying within the british military that officer is is removed from their role straight away until a proper investigation is undertaken hmm. yeah. which is you know quite reassuring to hear I, i'm not saying it's going to be perfect there but but that's a c- command and control um 
organization where they are actually trying to do but they also their, their leaders are taught command and control like you say and i've said is about for the critical moments you know and in the day-to-day running of the regiments etc cetera, etc cetera, yeah there's more there should be more of a transformational encouraging enabling um enthusing motivating type of leadership yeah yeah um my experience speaking to lots of people in public service about bullying and harassment is that uh, there's typically three outcomes from someone uh, mentioning or bringing up or raising a bullying and harassment claim. Uh, number one is that the, uh, well, let's be honest, number one is that the uh, person who's accused of bullying gets shifted sideways so they don't have to deal with the person they're bullying but their behavior is not addressed number two which is probably the most distressing of all is the bully is somehow promoted because we've seen that uh, we don't want to sack them because we're so scared of actually having a, a wrongful dismissal claim that we have to defend or the third one, which happens probably the most, the person who's actually put in the bullying claim gets so frustrated with the process and so frustrated with the lack of natural justice that they resign and leave the organisation. Well, mm. Is that pretty much what you've said? Um, I, I think, yeah, you're, you're very, very right. Um, I don't I don't necessarily think that the bully gets moved sideways. I think often it's the, the it's the uh, the person who's made the complaint of bullying. Mm. And I've actually you know, across the materials that I read around advice on, you know, for organisations and how to deal with bullying. It's saying, you know, move, move the complainant away from the influence of the alleged bully bully. You know, well, actually, if you're 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 the target of the bullying, why should you have be disrupted? You know, if you're working in a job that you're familiar with, where you you know you've got get on with you know your colleagues, etc. Why should everything be for you be upheaved and the bully stays where they are? It's what I'd say is really really important for organisations, and obviously, I, I I say this, I understand that for a very very small business, it may not be so viable. But for the larger organisations, that they have independent reporting mechanisms. So if I work for a large organisation and I'm bullied, I, there needs to be an organisation outside the organisation that I can report my bullying to. And there's lots of them being set up around, around the world now that I can report my bullying to. So it's properly logged and recorded and not distorted because it's gone through a compliant HR, etc., and secondly, that they use independent trauma informed investigators, you know, so that they're not people who have a loyalty to the organization. They're people who come in and take a truly objective view. And because they're trauma informed trained, they can deal with someone who's suffering, you know, as I was at that time. My, my mental health wasn't good at the time that I, I was, uh, you know, I, I'd been bullied, you know, and, and how can I say? Not confused to the point that I didn't know what was happening, but confused in trying to explain it sometimes was very, very difficult, you know, because of the way your mind's racing, um, you know, and you get very easy to go off on tangents and et cetera. You know, even when I was speaking about this, when I first started doing public speaking about what happened to me, I used to go go with everything written down and stand in front of a lectern and say to people you have to apologize for me having notes and reading from me it's not because i don't know what's happened with me but this is a very emotional subject and if i don't have those notes i'm likely to go off in a tangent when i get to a particular traumatic part you know and i've only got so much time to speak so yeah trauma informed investigators are really really important as well but definitely yeah. independent yeah absolutely all right um I read a little uh, piece on LinkedIn that you wrote uh, not long ago, but ostracization, what would you say ostracization comprises of? Well, simplicity, uh, simply, simply, it's one of the many, many different tactics that bullies might use. And that's, that's about, you know, cutting people out. Now, it could be a simple, you know, one of the things, one of the subtle things I had from my line, line manager was bullying, um, you know, which I was just putting off across again as a difficult person, was that he always had time to meet with any of my peers who were 
running different other departments you know within the command we were working with he always had time never had time to speak to me um he'd hold back um information of you know of of changes etc you know and i'd find out about them months later when it seemed to be common knowledge to everyone else so that that's part part of it but it can be you know as simplistic as well as a, as managers you refusing to speak to people refusing to invite them to socials after we're organizing socials after work where they're not invited and if that person who's instigating it has some influence power as a leader etc then others looking to ingratiate themselves with those will then also follow that ostracization so a person can feel very very lonely and you know and, and and as humans we are we are by nature people who have um um a need to be social and um, to be within a group that's uh, almost like a, a herd mentality you know where we need to belong to a group so you know psychologically we're programmed to you know to you know for for the alarm bells to go off in our brain saying you know I, i'm by myself this is dangerous you know because you know you go back to stone age man if a person's isolated or, or ostracized from you know the tribe and they're left to ro- roam the wilderness by themselves they don't have shelter they're vulnerable to, to attack etc they've lost all of that safety and that's all sort of st- that stuff still programmed within us you know and it can be very very disturbing mentally mm. Mm. I know in Australia we've got at least some legal, uh, well, we've got some legislation to protect against bullying and harassment. How effective that is is another question. But in the UK, is there is there, is there any legislation that outlaws bullying and harassment? Yeah, well, there's legislation for harassment. Um, if you're you you have protected characteristics then you can take in you know legal action um um for harassment but if you haven't got the protected characteristics then you're 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 not very well protected there's no legislation um around bullying the government in the past have stated that they put the um they think it, it whilst they think it's a really important subject um and uh, and people's well-being is 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 really important they feel the best people to deal with it are organizations through through culture you know leadership in organizations <laughs> through culture and stuff which has proved to fail especially as we've recently over the last couple of years had quite a few incidents of people bullying within government yeah, um, yeah. i i tend to suspect you know I, i'm a i'm a law graduate graduate and judges use this thing called the um the uh oh, i have one of those moments where the floodgates principle where they weren't allowed judge-made law to take something so far because they're they're concerned about the amount of litigation that it could possibility of litigation that could open for so many other complainants you know and have mm. a raft of litigation I mean, and i suspect the government are possibly taking that that tack you know, thinking you know well it's so rife if we were to legislate we'd have lots and lots of litigation but i actually think and i am you know the, the organization i'm working with stop hurt at work are doing a lot of work to push forward on legislation on workplace bullying and i think it doesn't all have to be about litigation. It can be about, you know, you, you work within, you know, with health and safety. You know, there are standards in there, you know, of there are standards in there for to ensure health and safety in the workplace, you know, around safeguards, around machinery, et cetera, you know, having fire doors, having the right fire extinguishers, making sure people fire drills take place, et cetera, et cetera. So why can't they do that with workplace bullying? Why can't they say, you know, our company over a certain size must have an independent reporting system. Our company over a certain size must have independent, must, you know, where bullying can't be resolved, a complaint of bullying can't be resolved through other forms. They must they must employ an independent trauma-informed investigator, etc. You know, to balance the fairness of this up, etc. It doesn't all have to be about litigation, you know, because as I said, you know, I suffered terribly. I but my I wasn't looking to get anyone into trouble and I wasn't like looking to make a fast buck out of it. All I wanted to do was to get on with a job that up until that point I absolutely loved and I just wanted the bullying to stop. And the best thing that could have happened is 
is that rather than being institutionally complicit, that leader had said, actually, things here don't look right. I'm going to have a word and, you know, and I'm going to say, you know, let's reset the thing. These are my expert to those bullies. You say that you haven't done this and this and this, but my expectations are I want this sort of behavior from people. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on it in future, et cetera. And I'm pushing the reset button now. And so often in cases of workplace bullying, that is the simplistic way leaders could deal with it. But they do obviously need to keep an eye on it afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I know in Australia, uh, as I said, uh, <coughs> we not only have legislation against bullying and harassment, but we've, we've also in our health and safety laws uh, in the last 12 months enshrined that uh, psychological safety is, is to be treated in the workplace at the same level of seriousness as as physical safety and that employers have to actually ensure that they provide a safe psychological workplace for the for the people who work for them um, that might be something that could be good um, in the uk but do you think it would be valuable if anyone in leadership positions was actually trained in how to identify some of the psychosocial risks that occur in the workplace, such as bullying and harassment? I do. I think, you know, I, I, I think I think it's really important that leaders are trained about, you know, about the things to recognise and about the harms that are perpetrated, not against just against the target, but the, the harms as in the cost to the organisation as well, you know. Because just as simply as demotivating your employees is going to have an impact on the success of your your business or, or or institution, I also big advocate when you know I mentioned trauma informed investigators. Mm. Well, I think leaders and and HR professionals should um, should all be trauma informed as well. You know, so that they recognise how to speak to someone. You know, and how to elicit you know all the facts from someone who has you know been put through that sort of trauma trauma what's what's really really interesting and i say this you know from police experiences if you punch me in the eye and i end up with a black eye you know i can go to my you know they, we were both working for the same company i can go to the employer and say you've just assaulted he's just assaulted me and the employer will probably take action and the police will come along and take action as well yep but in reality, that black eye after two weeks will probably go down and I'll be back to myself, apart from thinking, oh, I'm going to be careful I don't get punched by anyone else in the future. But you psychologically harm me. That trauma can stay with me for life. And yet mm -hmm. employers, they can ignore it or even, you know, further the harm by, you know, institutionally being complicit in denying it or trying to shift blame to you. But, and, you know, think that, you know, the police will take very little interest and yet, if because let's face gaslighting um, is 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 a form of coercive control, you know it's used in relationships a lot. Now mm. in the UK, I don't know about Australia, but in the UK, coercive control within relationships now being made illegal. So the police will deal with that in the in a relationship, but they don't do, will won't deal with it in workplaces. You know, whereas in workplaces, you know, you are in a form of a relationship. You probably spend more time at work than, you, you know, most often people do in careers than they do actually at home, you know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. Getting close to finishing, Jonathan, I just want to ask you one last question. Why Cornwall? Why Cornwall? Okay, so I, I, I sailed a lot and I, I used to come down to Cornwall sailing a lot. Um, I, I like the water, so I, I have a power boat. Um, I, I sail a lot. I have a, a paddle board and I have a kayak. So I'm by Falmouth. So we've got some of the, you know, we've got one of the largest natural harbors in the world. We've got some beautiful coastline. Um, I like to mountain bike a lot as well. It does have its disadvantages, though, because I do also occasionally like to have a beer with rugby mates and all of my friends are still left in Brighton, back, you know, just south of London. So every so often or whenever I get a chance, I do pop back to see them. So I'm speaking at a conference in uh, in London next week in the city. 
Um, but I decided that when I go up there, I'm going to stay in Brighton for three days so I can catch up with friends and go and have a couple of beers. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Oh, I've got to ask you one more question. How good is the Irish team at the moment? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't really been looking, actually. I've been a bit, <laughs> bit busy with lots of... Mark my here. words. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting here and now, and it's on my air so people can hold me to account, I think Ireland will be the World Cup holders uh, very soon. Um, they've, they've built a splendid team. Um, and well done to them. Yeah, in, in 2011, I was in um, New Zealand for the Rugby World Cup and I went to see a, a, a number of the home nations playing. And I went to watch Ireland playing Australia at Eden Park. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the atmosphere was terrific. And it was amazing at that point to see Australia beat Ireland. What what was really amusing was walking back into Auckland from Eden Park afterwards. Is you know you see some some very dejected Aussies walking back down into the centre of Auckland, you know, along the streets, and suddenly a whole host of leprechauns would jump out and start dancing and <laughs> chanting around them. But most of them weren't Irish; they were Kiwis dressed up. Ah, <laughs> oh, there. Uh, let's not. Let's not talk about the All Blacks, their supporters, or anything like that. It's too depressing for me. I've, I've been emotionally scarred for many years. Uh, Jonathan Wilson, yeah. thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really do appreciate your time, um, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Health and Safety Conversations with Tom Bourne. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week.